You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show, rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Oh. Make sure you're ready, because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. I work great. Thanks for joining us. I'm thrilled to be joining you. I'm such a huge fan of Hunter's and anything he does. <laughs> oh, damn, I was hoping you would say I'm such a huge fan of yours, Brian. Oh, damn. I'm a, Brian, I worship your podcast. I mean, it's a ritual thing, really. I, I was I just, gonna I was like, gonna say, come on man, this is this is the Brian Callen show. What the hell is going on? <laughs> I what did Hunter have to do with anything? Exactly. Raw. I'm just uh, Tonto in this situation. I just, you know, say cryptic Hunter, Native American Hunter things. books me all the distinguished guests. He's raised the pedigree of this show by about 100%. But, you know, Tonto is kind of on the rise. It's the Tonto moment. It's I'm true. I mean, you know, Johnny Depp is Tonto, and then there's that other guy, Darn right? Exactly right. <laughs> Darn right. That's what the trailer basically are, says. Are you in Syria right now? No, unfortunately, I'm in Manhattan. Is it unfortunate that you're not in Syria? <laughs> well, you know, for the sake of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can pretend. I mean, if you if you could just make some explosion sounds in the background, right? Exactly. That's, hey, that's why I hired a team. Like, there you go. Hey, uh, um, Rena, um, you you hear how loud she is? Uh, We're trying to get your levels down. So would you like me to you talking? Okay. It's loud on my earphones, but I don't know if it's loud sure. for our, you know. It's all good. I mean, I don't mind. She's going to love the voice. Her, ask her how she sounds, how you sound to How her. do I sound to you, Laura? Too loud? You sound fantastic to me. Oh, there we go. Good. Okay, so here's what's happening. We're getting yeah. an echo. Yeah, we're getting an coming echo from her, coming from you. Is. Is she in from me? Yeah, are you in a, where are you? Are you in a tunnel? I'm in a, <laughs> no, I was, in, I was in a conference room, but I guess maybe it's an echoey conference room. So let me go somewhere else. All right, Ooh, let's I try it. be padded or... Well, you know what it is. In these hip tech spaces, everything is a whiteboard. The walls are whiteboard. So that's, better. that's better, right? Wherever, where, wherever you are now is fine. Okay, I'll keep it. Yeah, okay. good. Okay, well, let's 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 start. Really, you have to go to the bathroom. Um, but you can, yeah, we'll start. You go. Go ahead. Awesome. Um, I'll start, my darling. I'm going to give you a, a an intro now. Uh, Laura, give me a, an idea of what um you're you've been you write for who specifically. Well, I um, have been a reporter for ABC News, Bloomberg Television, and Monocle Magazine. Okay. I still actively do journalism, but I broke away. I really went rogue from right. television <laughs> okay. to redesign news in the digital domain, kind of like you are, basically. We are going to talk all about that. I love it. I love it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to start, and uh, and we'll just go from there. Um, nice. Awesome. I'm excited. We'll have fun. We'll just have a, we'll just have a talk. Good. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Are we ready? Okay. All right, everybody. This is uh, this is Brian Callen, and this is the Brian Callen Show, joined uh, by Hunter Motts, my partner in crime, and the man responsible for booking all my awesome guests. And before I talk, um, I'm going to be at the Schomburg Improv in Chicago, the Chicago Improv, July 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th, doing stand-up bringing um, my new one hour to the stage. Only come if you like to laugh like crazy. <laughs> All right. Uh, enough about me. Uh, my guest, Laura, is it, do you say Laura or is it Laura? It doesn't matter. I say Laura. Laura yeah. Satrakian. Zara, Laura Satrakian. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, Laura, um, I think that means that you are Armenian. You're uh -huh. at least are of origin. Uh, the house of Ian, whenever you... Yes. Want, yes. And, and are you... Um, are you... Uh, from Armenia, you've been living. You grew up in the United States. W w did your family move uh, to an Arab country? I, I actually couldn't be more Armenian. It would be impossible. Uh, <laughs> I would. I, I actually. I, the Richter scale of Armenian would like break. Is that right? Um, and you speak. Yeah. Uh, you speak Armenian. I speak Armenian. My parents, uh, my whole family is just kind of peppered across the Middle East. I like to say that Armenians are like tofu. We just absorb the flavor of whatever country well, we're in. Well, that's right, because you yeah. had to, because after, after the, the oh, genocide right. and, the, and the diaspora, I think it was in 1917 or something, 
1915. Yeah, 1915. Uh, the uh, the Turks, I think, came into Armenia and they they didn't treat you guys so well. Not uh, so much. Yeah, not so much. And so that's why it's interesting how there there are Armenians pretty much in so many different Arab countries, uh, um, yep. Lebanon and Iraq and Syria and all over the place. And also throughout exactly. the uh, former Soviet Union in Russia. That's and, right. Yeah, that's right. Now now we were just talking, uh, Lara, for you guys. Um, Laura basically was a reporter for Bloomberg News and ABC and, and Monocle, the magazine, etc. But um, you went rogue in this digital age. And I think if I if I am, you know, being told uh, if, if Hunter's telling me the truth, you spent some time in Syria and you've been reporting on the conflict in Syria. Yes, those. Uh- those two facts are not unrelated. So <laughs> I was, a, no, I, I, mean, I was a, a reporter based in Dubai. I was specifically covering Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Arab world. Uh, very, very comfortable there. Uh, I loved the job. I was very proud to be an American reporter tracing around the Middle East. And uh, when the Syria crisis hit, it really hit close to home, especially being Armenian and knowing that you know, understanding that 100 years ago we were refugees and going through something decently similar in terms of tragic proportions, uh, and then realizing that in our in our time, when this happens to a country like Syria, the news media, the media market, how we produce reportage on a conflict is just not going to serve us well. Uh, and it, it was killing me because it was just the occasional piece I'd get to do between shots and then between, you know, film days covering the Ferraris of Abu Dhabi, once in a while I would get to do a Syria story, and I just didn't think that was acceptable uh, because it was too complex a crisis to cover the regular old way. Well, uh, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's interesting you say that because I, I, um, I get this sense, and I know I'm probably dead on, that first of all, we're not really seeing what's really happening in Syria, and we're not, we're not really getting the breadth of the tragedy and just how many people are suffering and dying uh, that's my feeling, uh, and and I think this war is a lot worse than people think it is. And part part of the problem may very well be the fact that this is a very complicated uh, conflict. Can you can you tell us a little bit about why yep. we don't hear uh, why we don't hear more about um, what's really going on on the ground? Number one, and number right. two, what's really going on in Syria? We know the Assad regime has been an oppressive regime. We know they're Alawites. I think. Um, and the majority of Syrians are 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 they Sunni or are they Shia? I'll work that backwards. The, ma- okay. the majority the majority of Syrians are Sunni. The minority of Syrians are Alawite, which is a branch of Shiite Islam. What happened in Syria is when they created the country um, over time, the Alawite minority took control. They the Assad family in particular, and then all the people they're close to, family friends. Uh, you know, their coterie from the mountains, the Alawite mountains of Syria, end up taking control and really running the country their way for four decades. Who helped uh, them do that? The French. The French, well, you know, who do we blame anymore, right, for these things? Um, the French uh, helped. The Soviet Union loved them. Iran has buddied up. You know, there are many enablers of the status quo in Syria, Russia now. And, and you know, to, the, to, the, to this day as well. I mean, I think that's the interesting thing is to what extent is Syria really a proxy war? Because the Absolutely. United States is, I mean, essentially there's whatever's going on between the Syrian people themselves, but then the international community is using Syria as a testing ground for their own conflicts. Precisely. You ha- right. You have Iran and you have Russia and you have China and they're this all is, supporting. This has been the, this has been the, the Middle East story for as long at least as the Cold War has been around, and really longer when, when the yeah. Brits ran, ran the world. I mean, this Absolutely. has always been... It seems to me that the Alawites were probably very smart back in the day to align themselves with whoever they had to, who was pulling the strings. I mean, cause And they the owned... French, totally. The French liked doing that. They favored the, the Christians in Lebanon, they favored the Alawites in, in Syria, and what happened over time, and various, you know, monarchies of the Gulf, you know, happened because the British liked these guys in one family and made him king. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's the, that goes far beyond the Middle East, too. I mean, the Mongols deliberately brought in foreigners, right, with light eyes. They used to bring in people who were non-Chinese because a minority that knows that if the regime falls, they're going to get wiped out is incredibly loyal. Mm. And so you, you always go. use whoever's the marginalized people. Yeah. There you go. So there we are with Assyria being run by the Alawites. Uh, people were not 
particularly happy or unhappy during the 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, there were massive uprisings of Sunnis in the Muslim Brotherhood and being beaten down in a very, very brutal uh, sort of fashion in the early 1980s. But by and large, civil society in Syria was apolitical. They didn't revolt. They didn't um, make too much noise. They just kind of accepted things as they were. Then came the Arab Spring. And when Egypt went down, when Mubarak went down, it was like the flashpoint for Syrians to consider this could happen at home. That sparked a combination of all of those folks who didn't like the Alawites, all of the Sunnis who were unhappy about what had happened in the 80s, a new generation of young people who wanted freedom and democracy, a digital, uh, digitally enabled crowd, I call them the Arab digital vanguard in Syria, trying to bring itself together and spark protests in light of what had happened in Egypt and Tunisia and around the Middle East. So here comes this protest movement, generally peaceful, very safe and kind of calm, started in Dara in the southern part of the country. As the Assad regime, as the Alawites cracked down hard and violently against these protests, you know, that accelerated what became a wave of, of very, very, very brutal tactics from the regime that have escalated into what many have called crimes against humanity, mass, mass, uh, mass murders, uh, massacres, hitting civilian areas with uh, basically missiles, you know, it's just indiscriminate killing, torture, sexual violence, everything has happened since then as the regime cracked down on the protests. But as they did that, the rebel groups stepped up and became military forces that tried to push back. That's what turned into the war. Laura, to what extent is Bashar Assad responsible for this? You hear him talk, he was an optometrist, he always sounds so incredibly uh, Western and and is he as much a victim of the entrenched uh, regime and apparatus that is Syria? The 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 the, are the people really running this? The the the, the yeah. people that yeah the the generals and the secret service, etc. Yeah, he is definitely the inheritor of a system exactly like you described. He came in, and you saw this. You see this across the Middle East. As fathers take the place, sorry, as sons, sons take the place of their fathers, they also inherit the system their fathers built. So he got, you know, he came into this with whatever intentions he might have had, with whatever inclinations toward reform, he inherited like a, a steel wall around him, the police state, the establishment, the security establishment, uh, everything, the surveillance system, uh, and an absolute ideology that we will fight to the death. We will not fall. The Assad regime will not fall. He is stuck with it now. And how responsible for this is he? It's quite dramatic. It's, it's actually very, very uh, disheartening to think about because he basically created a situation for Syria whereby if you don't have me, I will make Syria hell. If you, if you have an area that where I'm not in control, I will make it hell. My troops will bombard it. Uh, we will not serve. There are outbreaks of measles and leishmaniasis diseases spreading in the, because they don't go. They don't provide health care services anymore. So basically, it's us or total chaos and a, a moderate chance of Al Qaeda taking over. So you know, he created that. It's the old story. I mean, it's just it's amazing the kind of brutality and it's amazing how how in many ways we've evolved. Uh, if you look at you know humanity through history, but in many ways we're we're back to where we started. And what 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 do you think, Laura? What do you think the United States should be doing? What are we not doing? Uh, what do we do in this situation? I mean, my God, every time we get involved in the Middle East, it, it always seems like, you know, you've got one side that says stay out and another side that's saying you got to do Anytime something. we get involved anywhere. Yeah. You know? What do, what do we do, Laura? The sad thing is we've been behind the curve since the start. We never really had a clear American policy or a clear American strategy. I don't think anybody wants us in there uh, for a third Middle Eastern war. But we never took a clear stand, you know, and we've compromised America's standing in the Middle East. By, by really getting dragged along in a reactive fashion to what's happened in Syria. We've never really made it clear. We haven't stuck by our word. Uh, President Obama first said Assad should go in August of 2011, but we never backed that up. The, the, the biggest question for the, for, for the Obama administration, though, is if Assad goes, who fills that gap? I mean, that's, right. that's always been the problem. We, didn't, we don't seem to, or we didn't at least know, exactly who we were supporting it, with these rebel groups. So it seems like such a difficult problem. It, it, totally. Yeah. Totally. From a, from, a, from a Middle Eastern perspective, in that case, don't say you've got to go. Don't put yourself, don't put your credibility on the line. 
with mm. something that's not going to end up happening. Think about the day after and plan for it, but don't put yourself on the line. And in, in other respects, I made the case again and again. When you talk to geopolitical analysts, they say the U.S. should be coordinating, you know, unified aid to the rebels, you know, back the moderates among these rebel groups, really organize Qatar and Saudi Arabia so that all of the help to the rebels comes from one steady pipeline, instead of it being one sheikh in Kuwait who backs one group, another sheikh in Saudi Arabia who backs another group, and you just have these guys, like, in a total state of chaos and, and disorganized. Yeah. Now, this is, like, they say the game has changed. The Free Syrian Army has a general, Salim Adris, who is the head of the Supreme Military Command. We know him. We like him. We trust him. Ergo, we start sending small arms. But that's happening two years into a conflict that, you know, along the way, you have Iraq's al-Qaeda branch backing Syria's al-Qaeda branch, gaining ground. You know that people, what's happening on the ground, to your question of what, what it looks like um, in Syria right now, you have soldiers you know, on the rebel side who want to fight. When they go to the moderate groups, those guys don't have guns or money. They don't have food. You go to the al-Qaeda group, they've got guns, money, food, no uniforms. You know, where are you going to go fight? Well, isn't, 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 that sort of, isn't that sort of why Hezbollah has always had such popularity on the Arab street, in, in, uh, at least certainly in Lebanon. They, they were always sort of, yeah. uh, they run charities and all kinds of things. Yeah, it's a similar dynamic. Um, I know I, when I moved to the Middle East, I, I got to learn this word I'd never heard in the U.S., patronage, patronage network. In other words, exactly what you're saying. Hezbollah's got the guns, the money, the housing projects, the everything, everything. So they become more appealing. But you, and they mix that. So the Muslim Brotherhood does the same in Egypt. And you find um, you find patronage yeah. networks, you know, all over the world. You go to Papua New Guinea. I mean, that's in terms of what Brian's talking about. That's a stage of society that they're at. You know, when you don't yeah. have a functioning government that is inclusive, that operates under the rule of law, inevitably what happens is that it's all uh, it's all family relations. I mean, you know, my tribal, parents becomes tribal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my parents yeah. live in Libya. You know, and the the big word there is always wasata which is yeah. basically the idea of grift or, like, basically you have connections. That's how you make everything happen. Sure, but, but the, the, the Syrians are, are literate people, aren't they? They are very intelligent. They're conservative, but they're not radical. Right. They don't like this radical fringe coming in from Iraq. They hate the presence of foreign fighters. And, you know, this is, has this is devolved into a Syria no one can recognize or figure out how to put that together again. Well, the, 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 let me ask you something, because you've got you've got this sort of you've got this the two major branches of Islam, Sunni and Shia. And, and if I could, let me see if I can get the, the, the difference. The Sunni, the Sunni, Sunni, Sunni comes from Sunni, I think, from the from the 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 Quran was written in Sunni in poems, essentially. The Sunni is the idea of I think I'm, I'm right. If you are a Sunni Muslim, you follow the Quran. And and you 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 know the basic tenets of the Quran. To be a Shia is your cleric has to have a direct blood lineage to Muhammad. Uh, I think I'm right about that. Uh, there's there's definitely the theological split, and it comes down uh, it does come down to whether you follow the bloodline of the Prophet Muhammad down to the modern shapes or whether it's you're Sunni and that's not the case, but there are also ideological differences. You also find uh, you find a lot of of, of diverging beliefs between Sunnis and Shiites on how they see their lineage of sheikhs, but also the future, what what are the rules, different for Sunnis and Shiites, how they approach life. Um, So there are a lot of distinctions. The Shiites also have this notion of ishtihad, where you can, if there's something you think is, you know, open to interpretation, you interpret it, like you have a debate over whether women have to cover their heads with a scarf or not. So anyway, a lot of differences between Sunnis and Shiites, but it's just become personal now so so now so there, these percent. these divisions are very these divisions are very real however yeah. however it seems to me at the at the on the uh, flip side the middle east has a lot of young people that are embracing the digital age and want to modernize and is it possible are you optimistic at all that the the strong lines that are shia and, and sunni will start to blur as things like Commerce, the internet, etc., start to seep into the Arab. Isn't isn't the Arab Spring really more about uh, these these broad human 
uh, needs like democracy and, and having a say in who governs Absolutely. you. And, yeah, I mean. The, the, Absolutely. That is an incredible question. If nobody picks up on this, you're the first person who really picks up on this. It's because he's Brian Callen. That's because this is the Brian <laughs> Callen show, kids. <laughs> he's just brilliant. And don't you um, forget that, yeah. No, no. So he's brilliant. And aside from being brilliant, he's right. There's, there's a, there are two, more than two, but there are certainly two forces at play. Again, that Arab digital vanguard that has values just like ours, who want who believe in freedom of expression, believe in democracy, um, who want to see good things happen in, in, in their societies and are ready to step up and lead. That's why they're making so much noise. Um, and they're bigger. They're, they are the 60, 60, up to 60 to 70 percent of the Middle East can be considered young people. Um, so there, there's a youth bulge. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, it, there, there are, you see very radical clerics using Twitter, Facebook, Internet to, bro- to broadcast their views and continue radicalizing views around things that are happening in the Middle East. So it's a very, it is very weird um, to consider, but you nailed it. You have both a Twitter generation in the Arab world and uh, an, an Arab world that is still reacting to edicts written by sheikhs in the 1200s. That have been tweeted well, out. Well, things are happening. Yeah, yeah. That, the think... danger. Yeah, the danger is when when you have nothing to make yourself feel significant. And I'm speaking for young men. I, I can't get in the mindset of a woman. I know what a young man does. If a, if a young man feels like he's not significant, he'll pick up a gun and get significant. That that's the problem. And and unfortunately, in chaos and in war, you have people with bad ideas. And when bad ideas win the day. Uh, people die, people suffer. It's why I always on this podcast and when I'm talking to young people, you know, you, you, you may think you can avoid political commitment and, and philosophical commitment and, and, and you, but you've got to, you've got to do your best to know why you stand where you stand and why, what, what you're willing to fight for. Uh, because otherwise somebody with a sharp profile will come along and brainwash you and your friends, and you'll end up fighting for a cause that doesn't even exist. And I think the the thing that that is really important to remember here is in 2003, the UN published the Arab Human Development Report, Mm. and they basically did a study of access to ideas in the Arab world. Uh, There are about 10 million people who speak Greek. There are 250 to 400 million people who speak Arabic. There are five times as many books translated into Greek every year as there are translated into Arabic. Since the year 1,000, 10,000 books have been translated into Arabic. That is the same as the number of books that are translated into Spanish in one year. And the, po- the point that the, the report made is the reason why the Arab world is uniquely cursed with bad ideas, right? They went through a, a lot of Marxist regimes. They went through, you know, Syria as a Baathist regime, which is basically fascism by now another name. Exactly. Now fundamentalism. They don't have access to the ideas that are the building blocks of democracy. You have to remember the founding fathers didn't come up with the Constitution out of nowhere. They read Montesquieu. They read John Locke. They read all of these ideas that they then assembled together into documents like the Declaration of Independence. But that, that's a great point, and, but that is changing, isn't it, Laura? It's changing, and it's operational. So you had – so Hunter nailed it, and I loved that point. From the, and when I remember reading an analysis, one critique – of that, um, by Samir Kassir, actually, of that fact in the UN report. It's like, okay, so we don't have so many books, but everyone's having intellectual conversations in the coffee houses, so you don't account for that in a UN report. But I'm like, yeah, well, that, that, can be, that can be used for good and bad, obviously. But that populism spread, the way Hunter talks about, because you have one guy who stands up and makes himself popular, like Gamal Abdel Nasser, or to some extent, Hafez Assad, and that spreads over the marketplace of ideas. But, like you were saying, Brian, it's changing... And one of my favorite case studies is Serge Popovich, the Eastern European democracy activist whose manuals on how to get things done in protests and believe in democracy and make it happen were hugely popular throughout the Arab world. And wow. he mentors people. Wow. And, it's, and it's all digital. And that's, the, that's and great. That's great to hear, man. And yeah. the, I mean, you know, just to defend the UN, the other thing that they had in that report is they asked basically people around the world, you know, w- would you agree with the statement democracy is the best form of government? And the Arab world agreed with that more than Western Europe, Latin America or the United States. They also yeah. reject authoritarian rule much more strongly than any other place in the world because they paid a price. for it. They, right. They're living politics. It seems to me they're living and paying a price for, for bad ideas uh, every single day of their life. You know, I think. I think the other interesting question, though, is, is, you know, what Laura is talking about in terms of the double edged sword of technology, because you have to remember, Ayatollah Khomeini came to power because he was the first person to use basically cassette tapes. 
he would like record cassette tapes with all of his ideas, such as they were, and then smuggle those cassette tapes into Iran, and people would listen to them on the underground. And that's how he was able to, I mean, he was using mass media wow. better than the regime was able to use wow. mass media. L- Laura, um, don't you think, even though these, these days you have these radical Shia, I mean, radical clerics using uh, uh, social media to kind of garner their forces, don't you think, aren't you optimistic in the sense that the truth, uh, and when I say the truth, you know, the better ways to live democracy and freedom of speech and freedom of religion and women's rights and all these things, don't you think ultimately these ideas are, 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 are going to win the day. Isn't it impossible ultimately to argue against those great ideas, especially when you see them working so well in these liberal democracies like North, Western Europe and the United States? I mean, isn't, 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 isn't time on our side? Yes. I believe time is on our side. I believe time is on the side of those who are spreading ideas for positive change and democracy in the Middle East. And there's no better example than Egypt right now that you had a stolen revolution in the eyes of so many, the Muslim Brotherhood taking a winner-take-all approach and shoving a constitution down people's throats, and the same protesters who risked life and limb two years ago against Mubarak coming out against the Muslim Brotherhood to say the same. This isn't what we fought and died for. And I think it's incredibly inspiring. It's very messy. It's kind of confusing. But these guys and girls are coming out to to defend the values that motivated them and to successfully overthrow Mubarak. Now, I am a great uh, fan of tracking dynamics, almost like systems thinking in, in these sorts of contexts. And you see Egypt, and there are, there, are many, there are many dark forces at play. And you see, well, you know, you, know, you hear it around the Gulf. It's really depressing. When you go to the Gulf and you go to these very oil-rich Arab states and you, and you ask them, wait, why don't they put a down payment on the future prosperity of Egypt? Why aren't they really helping in significant ways? And people will say, well, they don't, want, they don't want it to turn out right. They don't want their people in the Gulf to see that Egypt worked, that democracy worked. So if you imagine... God, that's, a, that's fighting, amazing. That's amazing really to me. How, how, can yeah, people, I mean, how can people live with themselves? It, it's just amazing to me. You see it. You see it. And, and, and you know, so just imagine the uphill climb that these guys are facing, the, the new Democrats. And they deserve a lot of admiration and a lot of support that they're really not getting and they're not getting from the U.S. And it's just one thing what, that really surprises me. So what, what does the U.S. do... Let, let, I mean, let's take this. The, the something's happening in the Middle East. Something is moving. Uh, they are they are tired. It's a little bit like remember. I mean, look at the bloodshed in Central America and, and South America. My God, they were all military dictatorships, yeah. and and now they're I, they're all democracies. Um, yeah. And and uh, so so it, it feels as though even though it's a tribal area and they've got huge challenges, it just seems like this is the next. Maybe I hopefully do you think in 20 years we'll be we'll be looking at democratic governments in, in the Middle East? And, yeah. and, 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 and I'm sorry, to, the second part of my question is, what do we as the United States and Western Europe do? Who do we support? I think I love answering your questions backwards because they get this dramatic attention. I want to say, <laughs> what do we do? I'll tell you what we do. Uh, yes. <laughs> and Laura's what like, we do is we back the young Democrats. And luckily for us, it ain't that expensive. Right. Mm. Like this isn't like it was during Mubarak's regime, where if you touched the Muslim Brotherhood, our allies in, in Mubarak's era would have like cut our hand off. Right. Mm. Like they you, this is different, but we're still doing old diplomacy. We need to do new diplomacy, like young people. And you're they're easy to identify. I'm, I, I can give you names, but you know, there's a couple. But, you know, there are young, incredibly talented people in Egypt who are bright and putting their ideas out there and forming new political parties and launching initiatives. One of my favorite ones, uh, Masdana, this one NGO, for a while they were doing something called Cinema Tahrir, where they used the center, like the grassy patch in the middle of Tahrir Square, Mm -hmm. to air documentaries about different areas of life that they wanted to improve in Egypt. Wow. And when you agreed with the film, and then you become a town hall, they would turn a group discussion out of it, right? And then what people would raise when they agreed with the speaker, people would raise their hands and shake them like jazz hands, which would mean, <laughs> yeah, basically vertical but jazz it, wow. hands. <laughs> yeah, but it would mean it would mean both I agree and I'm tweeting this. Amazing. So, let Amazing. me let yeah. me ask you this as a crazy idea: What if you combined microfinance with supporting the Syrian revolution? Because Absolutely. Democracy, 
people, the, the civil society. You can call it whatever, but the people are there. Syria is a complicated one. There are civil society groups in Syria coming together and friends talking to them and, you know, figuring out. But, but even if you just take one of the, you can say, you know, completed revolutions, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, wouldn't it be a much better case study if we were helping guys like the one only the town hall with the documentary? Like, why aren't we? That, that makes sense. That engagement, that uses what I call like the creative compassion of the United States to jump in and help people making good things happen in their societies. That creates the social fabric that keeps the crazies from taking power. Yeah. So and, I don't understand how we don't do it. And that social fabric that you're talking about, I mean, in 2007, the, the United States Army released this manual that's now become legendary within Army circles called the COIN manual. COIN is just short for counterinsurgency. And they basically say there are two types of conflict. There are wars in which your goal is to destroy the enemy army. And there are counterinsurgencies, which is essentially most of what we're seeing in the world today. And the, it's, it's a mistake to focus on the terrorists. It's a mistake to focus on the enemy. Your goal is actually to provide support, opportunity, security to the surrounding population. Mm. Because if you support the social fabric and you support a productive society, then essentially you starve the crazies of recruits, of, you know, resources, of everything that they need in order to do their craziness. Mm. Yeah. I just think it starts with knowing exactly what is going on on the ground, what yeah. the conflict is about. Uh, but what I think the biggest mistake that the U.S. made in, in Afghanistan and Iraq even was that I don't think most people knew, first of all, knew very little about about Afghani culture, uh, if there is such a thing, because, by the way, there are three major groups, the Hazaras, the Tajiks, the, the, the Pashtun, the two different Pashtun tribes. Well, I mean, we were treating it as though if it was a country, as though Kabul had power over everybody. And and then we didn't know necessarily a lot about uh, Iraq. I remember when they did a, a survey, I couldn't believe it, and they asked um, all our House of Representatives, a bunch of uh, the politicians, congressmen, and, and senators, what the difference between a Sunni and a Shia was. And they didn't know. So the, the, when we had very few Arabic speakers, very few Arab and Dari speakers in the CIA and the State Department, by the way, and defense intelligence, we had very few. So, so it starts with knowing what's going on on the ground, having a real sense, a detailed perspective before you know who and, and, and what to help. And that also comes back to the citizenry. I mean, the reason why you don't have enough Dari speakers and Arabic speakers is partly because kids don't try in language class in school, yeah. you know, and it's because those languages aren't available in school. Or so that, I, have know, to, I have to make this personal. So I, I had to face the fact when I was covering the Middle East for an American audience that I loved and wanted to serve that we're just not a very well-informed society. Hmm. And it's, it's systematic, it's systemic, whatever. It's, it's, it cuts across. We don't learn other cultures in schools. We don't intensively engage other languages. Are by and large in mainstream press. We don't go cover foreign countries in depth. If you open up the file in someone's mind on Egypt, there isn't that much there. So how are they going to really relate to people until they really know their story? So that's why I left television to go digital because I think that the information marketplace is failing us. And I think the the, the really agree, nice I thing I agree with you on that, Laura. The really nice thing about Syria Deeply, by the way, guys, which I would highly recommend you check it out, is also what becomes possible in that context. One of the things that I love in on that you have on the site is firstly there's this great timeline of the conflict. And, you know, by taking this conflict, which is obviously it is messy and confusing, but by personalizing with those individual events like one of the things that Laura re referenced was the start. It's Laura, but keep going. Laura. Well, I'm sorry, you know. Keep going. Um, I, that's why I have Brian here, just to try and make me a better person. <laughs> I, keep the, I keep the names. I keep the names straight. Um, but the, you know, I mean, one of the things you were talking about in terms of the beginning of the conflict is it really was started by a bunch of 15-year-olds, I think, who started graffitiing on the wall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you find out things like that, it just adds a human dimension to the conflict that is so easily lost when you're, you know, just hearing Wait, about is, these large groups. is that true for First of all, your, the website is Syria Deeply? Yes, syriadeeply.org. Okay, syriadeeply.org. Uh, is, is that true? Is, 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 did this stuff start to happen with a bunch of 15-year-olds yep. and graffiti? Yep. yep, yep. Explain that to us. So you had a group of 15-year-olds in the southern city of Deda who were inspired by what had happened in Egypt and around the Arab Spring and started writing graffiti on the walls of their town, denouncing the Assad regime and calling for change. 
uh, Assad's police came after them and cracked down particularly harsh. And when the town found out that they had been beating and torturing these kids in detention, the town came out to protest. Jesus. And that's what really sparked it all and brought it home. Everything before that had been sort of marginal, but that was the flashpoint. And there wasn't, an, just like in every other Arab dictatorship, there wasn't an appropriate response. You didn't have Assad come out and say that was wrong of them, they shouldn't have done this. They just, all they know how to do is beat down the protesters. That is all these, well, they're, they're operating. They're them. murderers. They, they, you know, th that's what they are. They, these are sociopaths, people running these intelligence agencies and stuff. These, these, these are... These, I, you know, I'm so sick and tired of saying, well, they, you know, you hear about these, these, these atrocities and these regimes. They're run by sociopaths. They're run by, by, by murderers. That's, in, in the, unfortunately, when you have, in the way certain societies are set up politically, the people willing to kill whoever is in their way are the people that rise to the top. Well, they had a, I mean. That's what happens. The, the, and the big challenge now, I think, is for for Syria or or Egypt or any of these countries is to avoid a civil war because whenever you have a revolution almost always with the exception maybe of this country countries break into civil war that's what that's what I worry about and by the way we're already in one right with Syria so and 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 probably Iraq teetering on such yeah. right i mean Definitely, unfortunately. And I, I think that's the other th question, too, is what's to say that Syria doesn't split up? I mean, you know, you have, obviously, there's the Kurdish faction. You know, there are all of these different groups. I mean, is there a possibility that the country simply disintegrates? People have been debating this for about a year now. This question came up of whether Assad and his gang will basically take the Alawite areas of Syria, carve out a little statelet. And if you see there where the battle action is really intensified in the past few weeks, it's in those areas that would enable them to create a sort of safe passage between the few, you know, the, the, the areas that are still under their control. If you look at Syria today, much of the north and eastern parts of the country are in rebel hands or Kurdish hands. They're out of the regime's control. I'm still stunned, we don't make more of this fact, that practically all of Turkey's border with Syria, the longest border, is in rebel hands. Like, that's significant. So, that, is, that is significant. Yeah. yeah. So that's enough. So it's not that they, and, and, in, and the city of Aleppo in the north, homes, these are divided cities. Like, their regime, the regime still has parts of, these, of that territory. Uh, so no, there's no clear winner. So, but, but, you know, it, it is very conceivable that, in essence, the country splits up. Not because it recognizes that it's a new Alawistan or Christian Kurdistan, but effectively, these, these are, there's a completely different country happening in each one of those territories, you know, and the Kurdish north is pretty calm, but the Kurds are fully in control, you know, in the, in the Alawite areas, in, in uh, Latakia on the coast, and in those, those areas that are, that are all sympathetic to the regime, it's quiet, but there's a depression over the city because so many families have lost their sons fighting Assad's war. Jesus. You know? Jesus. So, and it's a, it's a resort town. Latakia is a resort town. So it's like a beach town that's now in a permanent funeral where you also have thousands of people streaming in from other parts of the country because it's relatively safe there. God, it's so you terrible. Know? Yeah, it's just very, it's very spotty and patchy. Well, well, it's patchwork. Can country. you give us a history of how, how who formed Syria? Was Syria, Syria oh, does boy. not... <laughs> yeah, it's a long one, I know. Because when you look back on Iraq, and these were countries that were essentially created by the British monarchy, weren't well, they? Well, you can or tell the French... British had their hands in it because there were so many straight lines on the map. They couldn't <laughs> you yeah. Know, yeah. handle Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, know, well, I know you'd have to go back to the Ottoman Empire, maybe the breakup of... Yeah, you know. this, like, exactly. So the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, two guys, Sykes and Foucault, French and British, decided to take it upon themselves to draw borders. Um, they decided to carve out Lebanon as a little Christian statelet, um, and, you know, Syria was as is. I should give you a more detailed accounting of the sykes Pico agreement. I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, but that's now constantly when, they, when you talk about the state of play in the Middle East and the Levant and Syria, Lebanon area, everyone's talking about the new sykes Pico. Like, let's go back and revise it because it wasn't done too well and it, it wasn't logical. It's tough, though. You know, as human beings, I've been living in L.A. now almost 20 years, and this is my home now. You know, you, yeah. you, you, it's very hard. Nobody cares about history unless it's really affecting you. What you want is a better future for your kids. 
and what you're interested in is, is the ability to trade totally. and eat food every day and sleep in peace. But I, mean, I think you know, I think yeah. that's the think, thing is, yeah. is that we live in I mean you know living in a place like the LA and like LA or living in the United States, you live in the illusion that you don't have to w- worry about the state that the state and yeah, politics and government course. will take care of themselves and you can focus on just making a living. You don't have to be political. That's right, and it's an illusion because the problem is is that inevitably what happens is is that when you have I mean the thing that terrifies me most is apathy, you know, and disengagement. And that's what Brian was talking about, because, you know, democracy and freedom, you know, the Bush administration, for all their failings, they were right about something, which is, is that, you know, freedom is not free, right? It has to be constantly fought for. It doesn't mean it has to be fought for with bombs and guns. A lot of the time it has to be formed by the cit- fought for by the citizenry and forming themselves and really making sure that they're in a position to make the sort of decisions that are necessary when you well, are that's voting. Be, it, you know. it, also, it also is important to be informed because it allows you to see uh, the problem before it actually grows into yeah. something totally. unmanageable, right? And I, Brian, when you were talking, Brian, about Sunnis and Shiites, it's really sparked a very, very big insight between my mind, which is that, yes, there are all of these differences between Sunnis and Shiites. And this has become an open season in the Sunni-Shiite battle. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, all are now part of this fight between, is it a battle for the soul of Islam? But what is that, is that true? Out, is that right? 100%. Wow. It is completely underreported as far as what we hear about, but there is a Sunni-Shiite battle that's now created a crisis across the Middle East. But what's really heated it up isn't so much the theological differences, although they're there. It's the in-group, out-group. It's the us versus them. The us versus them element, which, to go back to Hunter's point, I mean, any society becomes prone to that, you know. And when it becomes that, and especially in the Middle East, where it crosses all of the borders, because you have Sunnis and Shiites in in every different country, pretty much, and it ends up playing into all of these conflicts. You hear, we haven't been hearing about it for reasons I can talk about for another two hours, but Bahrain is a Sunni versus Shiite battle. Saudi Arabia is seeing protests in the oil-rich areas, which are a battle between Sunnis and Shiites. Egypt we saw the death of Shiites in the past few weeks, like in an attack, in a brazen sectarian attack. You know, and we hear this phrase, sectarian war, and it doesn't really make sense to us because it's not the language we speak, but these two sects of Islam, Sunni and Shia have created, now, now, open warfare. It is the sects of Islam creating a sectarian war that is going to shape the Middle East for the rest of our life. You know, you know as you're speaking, I'm reminded of the, the, the Protestant-Catholic wars that plagued Europe for 100 years, you know, yeah. certainly 30 very intense years. But, I mean, there were parts of Ger- Germany. I mean, there were whole towns put to the sword in the name of, you know, Catholicism or the name of... of Pro- yeah. And what happens is then suddenly... You, you, these bands of mercenaries break into different warlords, and it's just, it's, yep. it's amazing to me that peace even occurs among. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, it's, but it's, it's almost, you know, I mean, at least we, somehow we make it through. Man. At least according to Pinker's latest book, like peace is on the rise. If you look at, you yeah. know, across the course of history, yes, I mean, you know. it is less brutality. But Lara, are you going to go back to Syria? Have you have you done your your job there? And are you moving on to other places? I mean, with a heavy heart, what, what, what's your plan? Because I mean, I'm, I'm, how long were you there? First of all, I wasn't there very long. I was just there for a week. I'm okay. in, I'm in a bit. I have reporters going in and out, but I also have. Um, I have family living in Syria, in the Christian areas of Syria, okay. that are under regime control. So wow. I actually consider it uh, negligent of me to go tracing around embedded with rebel groups when I have family that could be affected. So our, our reporters do that. Um, they're incredible. They're fantastic. Uh, I edit the website, Syria Deeply, from wherever I am. Wow. I'm in the Middle East, sometimes in the U.S. Um, and I... That is, you know, it is my way to serve. I consider it a passion project that was really in service to an American public that wanted to understand what was happening, well, well, however many there are. But, you know, that's that's how we built it. We will move on to Myanmar deeply and you know, potentially looking at Myanmar deeply, Iran deeply, oceans deeply, autism deeply. We want to take complex issues and represent them better in terms of the information that's out there. I personally will not move away from Syria until this conflict is over. I consider Syria a bleeding patient, and you do not leave the patient. 
Wow. And I will turn my focus from this story. I'm but very, I'm very, reporters. very impressive, man. I, I, you know, a God, thank God for reporters. Thank God for people who. <laughs> it, I'm, I'm serious. We pay, we owe a debt of gratitude to anybody who's willing to go out there and really find the truth and figure out and inform us because otherwise these people suffer in silence and it, and it, yeah. and it only gets and the people with the biggest guns get their way um, totally. uh, you know but uh, you're in a very interesting uh, I mean you're in a very interesting predicament because in a way you're saying hey United States support the rebels yet you can't really traipse around with them I don't I don't I say we need to have a clear policy okay I'm yeah. outcome neutral okay. I don't I don't I don't advocate for any particular policy I just think we should have one well and I mean um, but the Assad but the Assad regime needs to go right would you agree with that or they need to be a lot of things need to happen yes that regime needs to go we also need to secure chemical weapons so they don't get used on the golan heights you also need to prevent you know secure and stabilize i don't pretend the more i know about this conflict the less i think i have the answers i think there are options not that's answers. that's isn't that that's the pro that's what's amazing the more you learn about how complex this is where does israel come in in all this man they are they are like you just said, the Golan Heights. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's been a point of contention for the for the for the Israeli-Syrian conflict since 1967. What in the world? Uh, what's going on with Israel? Are they basically saying keep it over there and just make sure you don't come over to our side? Or what, what, they're what they? staying pretty quiet, and they're smart to do so because any kind of involvement uh, or any kind of noise around Syria would just kind of boomerang back on Israel. I think. Uh, there is an, absolutely a sense in Israel that the the Arab issue, the Arab instability that is now touching practically every one of their borders, is a big security threat and very con- disconcerting. Um, I think you know the, the, Israel has managed very very well in the Arab world to, to kind of manage relations, manage its security, but the entire equation changed in the past two years. So there's a lot of sort of new ways of figuring things out. The airstrike that Israel launched. Uh, over Syria to take out what's believed to be, you know, weapons moving, you know, convoys moving weapons you know, they didn't really like. I mean, that was really, really, really strong message saying, you know, you've got your problems, but there, we have our red lines and we won't let you cross. Them. So, I, I've noticed that Syria, Syria, I mean, uh, Israel, I feel, has been very quiet. Even the Palestinian conflict, I just haven't read a lot about it. It just seems like somehow <laughs> that, that part of the Dr. world... Cover. Yeah, yeah, um, it's not getting any coverage, and and it, and it seems like everything's kind of. At a, I guess things are at a stalemate. I mean, is that what's going on? Well, there is a stalemate. Yeah. Or Go alternatively, ahead. this is good for them. I mean, that's the point. Is is that ultimately, you know, the 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 greatest fear of Israel is a concerted attack by the Arab nations that surround it. You know, and to an extent, if they're turned within themselves, I mean, balance of power politics. You know. I would imagine that Syria ha- would, I mean, Israel would be very happy, though, with a, a democratic outcome in these countries. They could trade with them. Uh, de- democracies tend to be way more peaceful in military dictatorships. I'd imagine it'd be in Israel's interest for the, this Arab Spring to win out uh, with with the, the people that, you know, all the three of us are aligned with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, but- you just have to take the very long view, because in the interim, you'll have Potentials for governments like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which has had this weird sort of take on its peace treaty with Israel. I mean, it's not going to be simple, uh, and the transition is, is not going to be pretty. But you have major developments in Israel, like the discovery of massive quantities of offshore gas, which you know would mean energy independence from Egypt. You know, you have you have a lot of developments that change the game for Israel, and it's a very very critical moment for them. I, I do know from Israeli friends. That over there, that you know, that there are really also domestic concerns on their minds in Israel. They're not really thinking about the broader region so much. Um, there are there are things that that Israel needs to move to, and that are, they're focusing on in terms of domestic politics. So that's part of it as well. And Palestinians just feel like they got overshadowed by everything else that was going on in the, in the Middle East. And yeah, presumably yeah. the Israelis are also smart enough to know that, you know, the one thing that would a- unify the Arab world. I mean, you know, if they take a side in the Syria conflict. The, the other yeah, side. Yeah, they, exactly. They, that, yeah, the other side's going to. The, the, the exactly. best thing you know that happens. What kills me? You yeah. know what kills me, guys? It, it, when, part of the rhetoric out of Hezbollah and the Shiite groups is that the Sunnis with Israeli help, are launching this rebellion. Like, you really think Jump on this right? <laughs> you don't have a lot of government? Like, I don't have intelligence saying otherwise, but that's a pretty far trend. Well, that, that, um, the, yeah, the Arab world's always been full of conspiracy theories. Yeah. It's so weird. Yeah. Like, the 9-11 thing, I mean, you know, 
It's just like, come on, man. Even, even I mean, one of the classic ones is when we were when we were involved in Bosnia and Serbia and all of that. Mm. There was this conspiracy that was floating around in the Muslim community yeah. there that essentially I we remember. were waiting until the Christians had you know committed atrocities on Muslims and then coming in. But when the, there was a Christian you know atrocity yeah, happening, I mean, we it, would go it, right in. It never ends. Yeah. I, I don't know. Again, that's like you said, misinformation, not ha- not having access to the real information, and all of that is changing in real time totally right totally right I thanks to people like laura Z- Z- tracking <laughs> i'm serious you're out there doing it and you know this is a great idea this this uh, syria deeply.org is the website and they are going to um do i, I guess you're going to tackle all, all kinds of complex issues that's thanks. the idea that's we'll fantastic see where it goes. well more and more people are getting their information from the internet so i you know i'm i'm encouraged i I'm a, I'm an optimist, and I I just think that ultimately, if you look at history, the the truth wins wins out. It finds its way, and and you know, I I I think that there is no doubt among, in people's minds everywhere, regardless of what your religion is and and where you stand culturally. Uh, I think at the end of the day, um, democracy as an idea. Um, and all that it entails, at least in this country and the things we enjoy, that has won the argument. Uh, it just has won the argument. You, 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 yeah, I think I, mean, I think that's the thing, though, guys, again, like complacency. There's a real danger to assuming that. I mean, you know, Francis Fukuyama, after the, cla- the end of the Soviet Union, said, you know, we've reached the end of history. Right. Essentially, democracy and free markets have won. Mm. And if you look at what's happened since then, you know, I mean, uh, Arguably, maybe the trend is still upwards or not, but there have been a lot of people. There was an article in, um, I think it was The Economist, basically about how enviable China's system was because, you know, they could build a factory in a week, whereas, for, you know, in America, you had to go through things like permits and yeah, all that Yeah, you know what? Stuff. And the Chinese can't innovate a damn thing. And the Chinese, by the way, when was the last time you bought a Chinese brand? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Well, uh, Banana Republic, uh, Restoration Hardware, you want to go through the list? Uh, you but know. that doesn't mean, I mean, just because... It you, means you love China and you should get on. <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, my point is not, no, I think that yeah. democracy and free markets are absolutely the best way to go. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that people don't forget that lesson and lose those lessons. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's got to be fought for. Yeah. And that's right. And we constantly have forgotten those lessons throughout history. You know, right. complacency right. settles in. and totally you know, right. You know? Right. I, from the ground view in the Middle East, which is also the ground view in China, which is also the ground view in Brazil, which is also the ground view in Turkey, what is happening in all of these countries at the same time is people connecting through technology and looking at their systems and saying, why do you decide for me? Which is like the most fundamental way. We think of democracy because we know it, right? But if you don't know democracy, what's the first thing that hits you, right? Shouldn't I decide for me? Why are you deciding for all of us? You just hit the... You just hit the nail on the head. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I always say that to people when they say, well, some cultures don't really want democracy. And, And I always say, there's not a person on the planet. And by the way, this includes children who doesn't want some say in who governs them. Yeah. I mean, that's a human, that's a human right. And I would argue a human instinct and impulse. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? And that's what's happening. That's, you know. Yeah. So the Chinese are saying it to us. We're not. We're not in the position to judge anymore. We, three of us in this conversation, are not the ones to say that China's system is kind of cool or not or debated. Obviously, we know where we stand, right? The Chinese are telling themselves and each other that this doesn't work. When there's a train wreck and you pretend it didn't happen, doesn't work. Huh. When you put like poison in baby bottles, doesn't work. Like central command and control does not work. And I don't care what our growth rates are. And I don't care how much the stock market is up. That doesn't work. That's a pretty strong message. Uh, that's a that's a great way to end this podcast, man. You are you are a breath of fresh air, and I and I I owe my I owe my partner in crime, uh, Hunter Motz, who's way smarter than I am for this because th- since he's been on this podcast, we've had some killer guests, and and you are included in that company. And uh, thank you, guys. Uh, seriously, man, and and you you we'll have you back if you have the time because I I could talk. We could you know I always try to keep this podcast in an hour. But I could talk to you for another two hours easily. And so if you're, if you're, yeah, if you're in LA, come out and, and see me. If you're in Schaumburg, <laughs> Illinois, <laughs> in July 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, I will be there at the Improv, Lara, and I'll do a, awesome. you know, yeah, I'll put you right in the front row. Awesome. Uh, 
Uh, I love listen, it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Hunter, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I actually had one last question. Go I ahead. mean, you know, you've... That's uh, perfect. Let's it, end with one last question. Um, you know, you've been talking about the fact that, you know, a clear policy. The United States needs a clear policy. And one of the things that the Obama administration has done is, is they've actually refused to say what the Obama doctrine is. What is our yeah. policy in dealing with the, the outside world? And the idea is, is that you know, the, the the problem is, is that, listen, there's a challenge always in creating any sort of doctrine, right? Because you have it have to have a doctrine that is accurate, right, that actually works, but also one that is clear, right? And that's incredibly difficult. And that's something that the United States has struggled with throughout its entire history, right? You have the Monroe Doctrine, where we said no European powers are allowed within the Americas, right? You had the mm-hmm. Roosevelt corollary to that, which basically said, oh, we're allowed to kick out any European power. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. the Truman Doctrine says we will oppose the spread of communism anywhere in the world, right? Mm-hmm. I, I absolutely, listen, I understand why Obama has not wanted to necessarily author a clear doctrine, because he said you should be able to respond to each situation as that situation requires. But there's a real, real problem with not issuing a doctrine, and I think that's that, A, the we don't know how to respond when situations like Syria come up, and B, the you know, American people, it's very hard for us to get behind what we're supposed to do, and C, the rest of the world does not know where we stand. Exactly. You know, and our, our, our actions and our behavior seem chaotic. Like, why do we invade Iraq and Afghanistan? Why do we bomb Libya? And why do we sporadically send arms to people in Syria? So it's a great point, Hunter. It's such a great point. Yeah, Obama's legacy, his legislative legacy and his academic legacy would have you stand uh, fall. Uh, that was exactly what he, he never really made a stand on anything. He voted absentee. He was an absentee voter for most of the most of, most of the policy when he was a he was so neutral and basically absent as a legislator. Um, uh, he was a community community organizer. I'm not surprised at all that there's no Obama doctrine. I'm not surprised at all. I know he inherited some serious problems. So did every other president. But it doesn't surprise me at all that the, he's basically been. Uh, you know, kind of a, I think it'll go down in history as being sort of a, not that overwhelming as a, as a president. And by the way, I voted for him twice. How about that? <laughs> um, but I don't know why I did, but I just didn't like the alternative. Well, but that's the reason why we vote nowadays. Nobody votes for someone anymore. People always vote against somebody else. I'm voting else. for Lara Zetrak. <laughs> but so, I've had my, it. I want her. My very, very long preamble was to say, like, what do you think the doctrine of the United States should be? Let me first say that what happens when you don't have a clear and unified policy and a clear doctrine is that you're inconsistent, and people spot that the way you were picking it out. How come we went into Libya, we didn't go into Syria? What's our deal with Africa now that Obama's doing it through a three-nation tour? When you're not consistent, you lose credibility. And when you lose credibility in the outside world, you lose your power to act at all in any context. So not having a clear doctrine... Even if that doctrine is principled and not, you know, a narrow thing, maybe maybe there isn't any equivalent of saying no European powers in the Americas. But there, maybe now it's a matter of principles, but it, it's standing by them. Mm-hmm. It's what happens in Venezuela now? What is our position in Venezuela now? You basically have an Arab Spring in Venezuela, and you have more. Sorry, worse, right? But like the the, the deadly violence in Venezuela. What's our position? Who are we? All of these people are fighting for the things we told them to believe in. So mm-hmm. what do we do about it? Do we even have a position? Do we have a message? I like I liked Obama's message at Cairo University. That they that was heard and picked up on. You know what my friends from Egypt told me today? Mm. Don't even say anything anymore. Obama's statement this morning on Egypt, the UN ambassador in Cairo are so behind the times they're just embarrassing themselves. Mm-hmm. These are Egyptians talking to me. Telling me like first they lost the plot. Then they were behind the curve. Now when they try to do anything, it just looks stupid. Just stay out of it. It's our business now. That's bad for the U.S. You know, you as, know? As, you, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the Truman, uh, the notion of containment, and the Truman Doctrine, which basically got us into Vietnam. So, <laughs> so it's yeah, a tough job. It doesn't mean job. you have to do something. It right. doesn't mean you have to intervene. But it means you have to know where you stand yeah. and signal that to people and say, be pragmatic if you need to. Say, these are the things we believe in. We're going to do what we can to support them, and we're not always going to be able to act. But we know you're, and we're not. We're not going to be afraid to speak up. You know, like it's, it's just, it's just. 
it's it's not you know somewhere we we lost it. Okay, I mean, we we're not over. America's not over. Like we are the only ones in the world. But but I got to tell you, people are wondering where we are. I'm hearing this on every continent. Where is America? Where where is that leadership? Because nobody wants this notion notion that Ian Bremmer authored of the G zero world. Nobody wants a world where there's no one able to to in, engage and make leadership happen. Not saying that America needs to blaze its guns on every continent, but to bring people together towards solutions, to take action on global issues. They want that America. They want the America that, that acts now, that acts on its principles, and maybe in a humble way, uh, you know, admits its limitations, but doesn't just defect. And that's what it looks like we're doing to the outside world. I'm glad you asked that question, Hunter. I am glad you asked that well. question. That's a, that's a great way. That's an even better way to end this. <laughs> Lara's Drakin, thank you. Your website is syriadeeply.org. And, uh, man, I, I appreciate uh, everything you say, and I agree with it. So, uh, And if I agree, you know if I agree with it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> then it's right. It's got to be true. <laughs> totally right. Lara, thank Sounds you good. so much. My pleasure. Thank you for, for having me on. I hope to meet you in person someday. Me too. I'll take you for having me. We're all it. Awesome. Bye. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash Comedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.